Good. Well, let's let's go ahead and get things started. First thing I want to do is welcome you to the UW Bothell campus. I think this is a a great day where we get to sort of celebrate all of our accomplishments this summer and uh, have a day of celebration before we have a day of being a little sad because we have to leave all of our new friends <laughs> right tomorrow. And um, anyway, welcome, welcome to campus. My name is uh, Dr. McLeod. If you need anything today, then let me know. I'll be making various announcements throughout the day. And I think to get things started, I'm going to ask Allison Heinrich to come up and introduce our invited speaker for this morning. Awesome. So, I went to grad school with Dominic at Dartmouth, so I've known him a long time. Uh, one of the first things I knew about him was that he was one of the co-founders of the Euler Archive. So they basically took all of these old works of Euler and cataloged them, translated them from like four different languages, right, Latin, Spanish, French, and German. And German. Yeah, so I always knew that he had a passion for history. Um, he also has a passion for undergrad research. So he is now the chair of the Mountain CS division of the Council on Undergrad Research. And the Council on Undergrad Research is basically responsible for the fact that the National Science Foundation has the REM program. So it's a really amazing organization that advocates for undergrads to do research. So he's kind of the perfect person to talk to us today. He knows a lot about this cool history that we're about to learn about, and he's passionate about undergrad research. He's also a number theorist for the number theory people in the audience, and has written papers with Eric Tao, who's one of our research mentors, um, including a paper on juggling. Uh, number of theoretical things that you can do with juggling patterns, which is really cool. So he's got a million interests. He's just publishing a paper in a journal on linguistics, which is incredible. It has some planar geometry stuff in it. Um, so kind of all over the map, um, a renaissance man of mathematics, I guess. So we're really excited to hear him talk about mathematical sites. Without further ado, Dominic Cleavey. For bringing me here. This is cool, uh, and I feel a little silly stepping in because you've all been working really hard all summer doing wonderful research, and I'm here to talk about none of that. Uh, this is different, right? This is our this is our warm up. This is our playtime, and it's a little bit of a chance. I, I like to do this sometimes with students, especially after doing what you've been doing weeks and weeks, where you're focused on one very particular little piece of math. Is to step back and think about what math is and what math is like, what we know about the way we do math. Uh, can we understand it? It's hard, of course, to understand something as big as math. And I'm really convinced, I've been convinced for years and, and more convinced all the time, that history helps. But if we look at the stories that we can tell from the many last thousands of years, that we learn something really interesting and something useful about uh, what math is like. I want to reflect on some of this today. And uh, really briefly, Congratulations, I understand that you've been doing really great work. I've heard about a lot of it already just in the last 30, 45 minutes from the advisors who are here. Nice job. I don't see you personally. <laughs> All right, what, what is mathematics? I think if you ask a random student sitting in a classroom, a student who says they like math, they'll tell you about math. They'll tell you that mathematics is logical. I mean, a series of logical steps, and it always makes sense. Mathematics is eternal. You've heard this before. <laughs> Once you know something in math, it's always true. This is why we really like it. Math is perfect. There's a way to do math. There's a best way to do math. And the way we do math is the best way to do math. That math is objective. This is another reason people say they like the subject. The emotions don't get in the way. Uh, you don't have to worry about how you're feeling that day. It's just the way math is. I'm here to tell you I'm convinced none of these things. <laughs> and if we really want to convince ourselves that none of these things is true, all we have to do is look 
a little bit at the conflict, at the fight, if you like stories of fights. Yes. Think of the last 10 movies you enjoyed seeing and ask how many of them somebody got in a fight. All of them will be the answer. Uh, and mathematics is no exception to this. So many people, the great people of history, have fought and have fought and have fought. And when we look at this, we learn a lot about what it is to do mathematics. All right, so we're going to introduce this in five stories, five mathematical fights. And I'm experimenting with something new uh, in my talk repertoire. You ready? This is sound effects in a math talk. <laughs> Some of you might not be impressed, but for me this is like high tech. Alrighty. So, fight number one. We have you great. <laughs> First is Nicomachus. At stake, whether or not two is a prime number. Alright, you went to the dates, you'll know we didn't exactly fight in person. You would die long before Nicomachus, but this is our warm-up. Uh, but really a chance to get going. Alright, so let's think about this question. You all know the answer, uh, but let's remember we get to make up our own definitions in math. What is a prime number? We could say this. Uh, it could be a number that's only visible by itself in one. This is what you'll often hear if you ask a person who wants to go into a math class. Uh, which number is our prime in this case? It's one, two, one. Five, seven. Uh, we could say it's an integer uh, that's not one. That's only visible by itself at one. Maybe we don't want to include the one, so we'll just insert a little more few words in the definition forbidding this. Uh, we could say it's a number that cannot be evenly divided. Can't be evenly divided. I guess two can be evenly divided. If we did that, we might write three and five and seven. Uh, what is Euclid say? You know, Euclid is a Greek mathematician. We should be careful here. He lived in Egypt. As far as we know, he never even visited Greece. Uh, what does this mean? He spoke Greek. He was trained in a Greek style school. Uh, he believed in Greek gods. It's part of the culture. It's culturally Greek. Uh, he wrote the elements famous. So here's what he said about prime numbers. He said, Protos, Arithmos, Estino, Monadai, Muo, and Metromenos. Did you know? Now that you're math students, you can read Greek. <laughs> you ready? I'm going to give you a bonus three minute Greek question. Alright, so uh, let's pick a word. Uh, how about this one right here? First letter is what? Yeah. It's an alpha. You use good sound the alpha makes. Kind of an awesome. sound. How about this letter is this? Okay. What sound do you think ro makes? <laughs> it says err. Uh, clearly an if of some kind. It's in Yoda, but it looks like an I. Right? What's this? It's a theta. You know what theta says? It says Really useful, by the way. I think a letter that says you're trying to teach children to read like kids are five and eight now. They're learning to read. Uh, what does a T say? T. What does an H say? H. Put them together. T. H. No, no, no. It's <laughs> really. Uh, the Greeks don't have this problem. It's a symbol for this. Put uh, it here. U says. Clearly, an O is an Omicron. And a sigma says. So we sound it out, like you're three years old, you sound it out. Arithmos. It's okay if you're slow. Um, for the next language of today. Arithmos. What is arithmos? Do we know words that have this in them? Arithmetic. Arithmetic is having metis or craft about arithmos, meaning arithmos is probably. What do you do? What do you do arithmetic? It's a certain kind of math, though, right? If you're tiling, uh, you're not doing arithmos, not doing arithmetic. It's numbers. Everything is all about numbers, right? There you go. Arithmos is numbers. And maybe the word looks strange to you. You sound it out. You might know from context what it is. Protos. Oh, I've seen proto before. Proto something is like the first one. Uh, it is indeed. It might not surprise you. This says the first number or the prime number. A prime number is that which is measured by the unit alone. If you're Euclid, uh, and you want to think about what a number is, what you're really thinking about is the length of a line. How do you measure it? You have a smaller line that you want to put next to each other a certain number of times, and if they end up exactly equal, uh, we've measured it. You can measure 10 by having a little stick of length 2 and putting 5 links to each other. Uh, you can't measure 7 with a stick of length 2. That's going to stick out over the end. You can only do it with a unit. So 7 is prime. All right, what about this guy? Slightly less famous, Nicomachus, also a Greek mathematician, lived in the modern country of Jordan. Uh, he was part of the Pythagorean school. He would have still believed in much of what Pythagoras or his school uh, would have taught. And he wrote an introduction to arithmetic, a really fascinating book. Uh, if you've not read it, know that it's available for free download in Greek and if you're feeling lazy, 
uh, English translation, online, uh, uh, which he talks a lot about arithmetic and also about the properties of numbers. Which ones are powerful? Which ones are masculine and feminine? Uh, which ones are kinder or friendlier? Uh, it's really sort of bizarre and wonderful in the same way. He says, it's an odd number that cannot be evenly divided. You see, prime numbers are numbers you can't split up evenly, and of course you can split two of them. Uh, we ought to count it. Uh, let's think about this. What if we go with Nicomachus' definition? Remember for him, two is not a prime. And so what should we say? Well, we might say this. Here's a nice theorem about arithmetic. Every positive integer can be written uniquely as a product of primes and some power of two. All right, uh, doesn't bother me very much. Here's a theorem you can prove, Nicomachus' system. All primes are off. That's sort of nice. But, but you can think about the fact that two is the only even prime. Does not mean two is kind of odd? In the Kamakata system, we can also ask this, how many prime numbers are there? And the answer, of course, is infinity minus one. <laughs> well, what about number one? Neither of them seem to think one is a prime, but why not? You were taught this, right? One is not a prime number, says your teacher. Why do we say this? This is a recent definition. This is not what you would have been taught had you gone to school 100 years ago. In fact, there's this wonderful book published in 1908 of D.H. Lambert, which she just listed all the prime numbers up to about a million. Uh, about 10 million. Um, and one is included in the list. Uh, he counted one as a prime, and a lot of people did at the time. Uh, I guess we can make up our own definition. Uh, why did we change? Why don't we want one to be prime? Well, the answer is, uh, is this, is the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. It's important to say it with gravitas. Uh, it's one of my favorite theorems. It was one we alluded to earlier. It says that every positive integer can be written uniquely as multiplying prime numbers. It also gives us a new answer to the question, how many prime numbers are there? The answer is the perfect amount. <laughs> right? There are so many primes that whatever number you pick, I can get that number by multiplying primes together. There are so few primes, there's no number you can pick that I can get multiplying two different sets of primes together. They're perfectly spaced in the integer. This is why we love them. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful theorem. There's a number of theorists. I love that this theorem, if one weren't prime, it wouldn't be true. Right? What's your favorite number? 42 is the correct answer. <laughs> uh, certainly we can write 42 as 2 times 3 times 7, but by if 1 were prime, it's also 2 times 3 times 7 times 1. Or times 1 times 1. Or, 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 it's not unique factorization. There are infinitely many ways to factor everything. It would make me sad. It would make number theorists sad. And we don't like being sad, so we can it. This is it. Uh, that's the only reason for the definition, is we like the theorem of the way it's written. All right, let's summarize what we know so far. Euclid versus Nicomachus, let's take the formality of two. Who cares? This is a big deal. Thousands of years of number theorists uh, care about this. The winner, in the end, as you know, was Euclid. His book sold better. <laughs> and we use this from now on. All right, fight number two. We have Cardano versus Tartaglia. A battle over who gets credit for the cubic formula. Now this is a weird one, fight number two, because before we can do fight two, we need fight two minus epsilon. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back a little bit and see where this comes from. Uh, it starts with Antonio Fiore. He was a student of Scipione del Ferro. If you want to know this story, remember this story, you need only think of their names. Del Ferro is the person who starts this. Uh, Del Ferro learned how to solve cubic equations. Like a quadratic formula, but for cubics. Uh, really just for depressed cubics. It means they don't have a quadratic term, and it was still impressive at the time. Uh, I said, look at their names. How's your Italian? Come si dice Del Ferro. That's it? Of, of five? Close, close. Five. Iron. Fe in the periodic table for iron. Uh, this is ferium. He is quite literally Iron Man. <laughs> oh, so what it means. He's, he's the Iron Guy. Uh, the man of iron proves the theorem. And when he's dying, he tells it to his student, Fior. Fior. It's a flower. 
he's not as tough as the second guy. Uh, this shouldn't surprise us from the name. Fjord is thrilled. He finally knows how to solve the rescue that nobody else in the world does. So he marches right up and challenges Tartalia, I kid you not, to a mathematical duel. Let's see if we can make sense of this. Uh, remember the quadratic equation? Uh, you've known this for a long time, but it's like it's kind of cool. Right? Uh, look at the coefficients of any quadratic, you plug them into the equation, or whatever number you get, and you put that out of the quadratic, you always get exactly zero. Uh, anyone know the solution to the cubic off the top of their head? <laughs> it's sort of like they be plus or minus the square root, but it's a little bit different. We'll, we'll come back to it. Uh, we can even do a depressed cubic. If we remove the quadratics, it does get a little bit easier. Uh, let's think of what's happening at the time. If we are 16th century Italian professors, there is no tenure. You have a job for a little while. Well, your position is very vulnerable. In fact, you can be challenged at any time for your position. Uh, and a challenge is a series of 30 problems. You challenge me for my job, and you get to send me 30 math problems. I'll then send you 30 math problems. We each have a month. It's usually a month. Whoever solves the most problems is better and gets the job. <laughs> hmm. All right. Uh, and so, Fjord, this guy who's a little blur, who's a lot work, right, has learned the solution, heads off and challenges Tartaglia. Tartaglia's name is Niccolo Fontana. At the time, they called him Stutterer. Tartaglia, he had been injured when the French attacked his town. He was the result result. He couldn't talk well for the rest of his life. Uh, this presumably not that nice name in South History that you remember saying. Uh, this is how you find his name in most books. It's Tartaglia. Tartaglia had to make 30 problems, so he sent him 30 cubits. It's like he's the ultimate one-trick Kobe, right? Uh, Tartaglia is desperate to know what to do, but frankly, when your job is on the line, you work so hard. After 30 days of thinking, he figures them out. He figures out how to solve cubics. Uh, he gives the answers, right? Everyone knows that he succeeded. Uh, and he keeps his job. You are, by the way, disappears from history at this point. We have no idea what happened to him. We can only assume he slumped away in well-deserved disgrace. Uh, <laughs> but Cardano hears about the duel. Here's what Tartaglia has done, and he's desperate to know. And so Cardano uh, traveled uh, to Tartaglia and said, please do tell me how to solve the press cubics. And then Tartaglia said, no. And he said, pretty please, please tell me how to solve the press cubics. And Cardano said, no. He said, if I promise I'll tell anyone, pretty please. And he said, if you leave me alone, I'll tell you how to do it. So Tartaglia finally gave him a secret. Swore to him, swore to secrecy. Uh, but Cardano, after working on this for a while, and really getting an even better result, found a loophole agreement as far as he was concerned, it published the result and got everlasting fame for what he did. People who still most of the time credit Cardano for having done this. By the way, you asked about the formula. Anybody remember this yet? Here it is. <laughs> Take any cubic, plug A, B, C, and D into this uh, lovely little expression. Uh, and what you get will always be a solution to the cubic. The fourth degree one is even crazier. <laughs> uh, you haven't looked at it before, it's worth a great big search for. It. It's, it's fun to look at. Arguably not worth memorizing. <laughs> Alright, summary. Cardano versus Tartaglia. At stake, credit for the cubic formula. Uh, who cared? At the time, at least, this was a very big deal. The winner certainly heard up. We have a message to take away from this, have a life lesson, it can only be publish your work. <laughs> Uh, Alright, fight number three, and perhaps the best known of mathematical fights, we have Isaac Newton versus Gottfried Leibniz. About the only thing that we care about when they fight is the credits for the calculus. I don't want to go into details of the story, perhaps you know it. If you don't, there are many good books about it. Instead, I want to think about why it matters, this fight. Uh, and I'm going to replace the story with a quick timeline. All right, uh, with the caveat that, of course, this is only 90% true. Uh, <laughs> but it's good enough for our purposes. 1666, Isaac Newton invents calculus. A remarkable year, 1666. Uh, you know, this story, let me pause just for a minute on this story. Uh, Newton is a college student living in London in 1666. How's your European history? I can remember about 1666 in London. What happened? Plague. Plague broke out, and? Fire. And fire. It's scary time, 1666. You see, a lot of people were worried the world was going to end. And you guess what? 
Uh, it looks like 666 on the calendar, this was scary. Uh, not only that, it's the seventh year since the Puritans have no longer been in charge of England. If you're a 17th century Puritan, you're convinced you're God's people. You have brought God's kingdom back to earth. One reading of the Book of Revelation suggests that seven years after God's people come to earth, the work ends. And it's the 666, right? Uh, it really seems clear. And then in January of the year, as you say it, the plague breaks out. Remember the four horsemen of the apocalypse? The first one is pestilence. It's exactly what you'd expect. And then toward the end of the year, London literally burns to the ground. There are stories of preachers standing in the streets of buildings, collapse in flames around them, crying out, repent, the world ends today. And a rational person, I think, could be forgiven for believing it at this point. The evidence was very strong. Uh, it didn't. Spoiler uh, alert. <laughs> it was fine. Now look at this scary time. Isaac Newton, meanwhile, didn't stick around. You see, you have a place to go. You don't stay in the big city during the play. So he went back to his family farm and spent the year thinking hard about stuff. He decided to try to finally understand things that had confused him. And by the end of the year, he had uh, invented differential calculus and then integral calculus. He had formulated laws of motion, including things like inertia and inverse square law of gravity, and then used his calculus and new laws of motion to explain the motion of, of everything, really, apples and cannonballs and the moon. He then went on to figure out the laws of optics, things that historians of science say would have taken Europe 100 years had he not done it. Uh, this took him about a year, and it's a lie to say he did everything in exactly the year. He was thinking about some of the things before, some of them after. Uh, but in human history, it's not clear to me one person has ever done more in one year than Isaac Newton in 1666. Einstein in 1905, you can remember it's maybe another one. This is quickly quite remarkable. When he was done, he went back to college and told nobody what he had done. <laughs> See, Newton was not like other people. He finally understood how the world works, and he didn't give a damn about anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Almost ten years after that, and uh, as far as we know, independently, Leibniz invented calculus. Another ten or so years after that, uh, I'd like to say nine for each of these, you all. Uh, Leibniz publishes calculus. Twenty years after that, Newton publishes calculus. I said, oh, and by the way, I did this way before it goes. And then they started fighting. In particular, their, uh, their followers, Himerson and fans, started fighting. Now, uh, the fights are interesting, but not what I want to talk about. What I want to think about is whether or not we care about the fights. And let's answer the question this way. Uh, let's look at people who made major contributions to the theory of calculus. I came up with this list, uh, not in sort of a biased way, so I'm going to make a point that it's been to William Dunham's book on the history of calculus, which has a chapter on the type of and wrote down the names of all the chapters. Newton and Leibniz, the Bernoulli's and Euler, uh, uh, name goes down here, and uh, let's play a quick game. What do you notice about the names of the people on this list? All right, Newton's first. Chronologically, at least, uh, his names. Ignore Newton and look at all the other names. If you want to hint, let's play a related name. Let's look through the uh, names, and you tell me where the people are from. All right. Leibniz, German, is right. The Bernoulli's and Euler, do you know this? Or all from Switzerland. How about Cauchy? He's French. Riemann is German. Leo V. He's French. Weierstrass, German. Contour. Voltaire. He's Italian. Bear and Lebec are French. With the exception of Newton, they're all continental mathematicians. You see, Newton and Leibniz did calculus a little differently. They wrote it a little differently. Uh, the two camps wouldn't talk to each other, but Leibniz was better. Notation was easier to use. It was more flexible. And when you worked in that area, you made really good progress. For 150 years, nobody in England made a meaningful contribution. Here at calculus, they worked on it, they tried, they spent tens of thousands of good, talented hours of mathematics accomplishing nothing because they didn't talk. Sometimes it really is important, the fights and what happens. We're going to take, of course, credit for the calculus and the uh, notation. We mostly use a lot of this notation today, they you'll find Newton's in various places. Uh, people who do theoretical mechanics 
don't use Newton's notation quite a bit. Who cares? I'll say everybody cares. This is a famous story, but people who know nothing about math know about this fight. And the winner, in the end, it was tough. Look at your calculus book today, and it will tell you uh, that Newton and Leibniz invented calculus. Uh, their name's almost obvious. Here, yeah. Fight number four. <laughs> we have Yalka Bernoulli versus Johan Bernoulli. In the ultimate battle over, who is the better brother? <laughs> it's a different kind of fight, but still one that gives us something useful in mathematics. All right. What do we know? Uh, there are two brothers. Jakob is older and quite a bit older. And he was Johann's teacher. At the time Johann was ready to learn math, Jakob was quite a good mathematician. You can, by the way, you'll see these people's names written in different ways. This is their uh, German versions. Johann is just a German name, John. So he's sometimes John Renouli, sometimes Jean Renouli, which is a French way of writing the name. Uh, it makes it a little bit annoying sometimes. So look at these. Uh, it seems to be, when they were young, they got along well. It seems to be Jakob did a very nice job teaching his younger brother. And then it seems like, at some point, they started to fight. The first recorded fight we have is over the Catenary. Older brother Jakob uh, published something in 1690, published a problem for mathematicians. It was to find the shape of the hanging cane. This is a Catenary, right? You hold up a string, hold up, I don't know why they called it a chain originally. Hold up a wire, hold up a rope. Uh, look at the shape. Uh, that it traces, and you ask yourself, can you really carefully describe the shape? Can you give a formula or an equation for the curve that's traced? It looks a lot like a parabola. Gail Mayo was convinced it was a parabola, but it's not quite a parabola. Uh, can you figure it out? Well, as we, uh, reports say, younger brother Johann said, that's an easy problem. Uh, of course I can solve it. He dashed off a solution overnight. Uh, and then bragged about it to his brother. I heard he's kind of long friend on this. Uh, he finally <laughs> published this. Uh, this is the paper where it first appeared. Uh, and several people sent in solutions. Uh, Leibniz solved this. Uh, Christopher Huygens solved this. And the younger brother solved this. Uh, Jakob published the winning solutions the next year, but only in full the first two with a brief mention of his brother's name. Uh, still bitter about the gloating over the breakfast table. <laughs> They moved on to the isoparametric problem, and it's a really nice old problem. If you're given a certain length of string, how do you enclose the most area with it? Now you might guess the answer is a circle, and you would be right. Uh, right? The obvious answer is the correct answer. In this case, it's really hard to prove. So can you prove it's the best solution? Uh, you also might know this has a really old history, this problem. Some people trace it back to Virgil's Aeneas. Remember this guy, Aeneas, before he founds the Roman people, he's a sailor over the Mediterranean, uh, and he gets to Carthage. Carthage, the great city founded by Dido. How did Dido found the city? Oh, that's also the Indian. It said when she landed at the area and said, I'd like to found a city, the people who live there said, you can have as much land as you can surround to the hide of a bull. So she took a bull's hide, cut it into very thin strips, went against the ocean, and laid it in a perfect semicircle around the ocean. Believe she had surrounded the most area. Brilliant mathematician, Dido. Uh, he was correct, and this problem continued for a long time. Maybe given some constraints, can you find the shape that surrounds the most area? Uh, well, Jakob, older brother, found a third order partial differential equation that gave the correct answer and really a proof of it. Johann, there was only a second order differential equation, and oh, did he gloat. <laughs> you need third order, really. Uh, he would have said again and again, he sealed the solution and refused to let his brother see it. <laughs> Years went by, the older brother finally died, and Johann said, all right, now I'm going to show him. Uh, so he opened the envelope. Oh. <laughs> um, Lord and older brother, but this is a very kind of dumb mistake. Uh, so Jakob died, and he couldn't do what his older brother had done. Uh, Let's note, however, in their battles, in their fights, they did remarkable work. Uh, this, this theory of all these problems we talked about here are part of the calculus of variations. It's an important uh, theory. And they developed it. And they developed it maybe out of the love of man, maybe out of the quest of greatness, but really, really out of sibling rivalry. <laughs> fights can help sometimes. Uh, and if we don't think competition is useful, we only remember the brothers. All right. 
Summary then, what was at stake? This. The claim is better. Brother. Who cares? No one else cares. Uh, right? Uh, and the winner? You know the answer to this, don't you? When brothers fight. No <laughs> I will tell you, there are something I believe. Johan was better. There's a very good reason for that. You see, in addition to doing really good mathematics, Johann Bernoulli eventually took a chair of the uh, mathematics department at the University of Basel. And there, on Saturday mornings, he took a student who was interested in learning a little bit more. That student is... Leonard Orr. Without Johann Bernoulli, we wouldn't have had Orr's Day. Orr remains my favorite mathematician and my Orr tie on today. Uh, <laughs> celebration of Euler. And uh, my last story is about him. This is a really remarkable story, and it comes with a math riddle, which I'm going to leave you with as we start going forward. Leonard Euler versus Jean Marone d'Alembert. They were friends for years, they were colleagues in much. Eventually, they had a huge falling out, refused to speak, and sniped at each other in the press over the very serious and contentious question of what is the natural logarithm of negative one? <laughs> Story of how this happens is our last fight today. Uh, all right, again, a bit of background. We know about Euler. Uh, he was brilliant. He did math. He did physics. He did all sorts of really remarkable things. He was a very humble man. He was really generous with sharing credit. There are lots of stories of him solving a problem, and then six months or a year later, somebody else writing to him and saying, "I solved this problem." Uh, it's the same problem. He's like, "You know what? You go ahead and publish it. Uh, you can have credit for it. I, your solution's better anyway." Again and again. Uh, Maybe he did hate it. Right? He published 866 papers and books. <laughs> and he was a couple, you'll probably find. But he was really, really a nice guy. Donald Bear, not so much. I'll also tell you, if we weren't in a math group, if we went to a philosophy department, or a history department, or a sociology department, uh, people won't have heard of Euler, which makes me say that every day. Uh, but they will have heard of Donald Bear, who was considerably more famous. He was a reasonable philosopher. He's best remembered today as the amount of people who put together the encyclopedia. The French Encyclopedia, uh, the French Revolutionaries, uh, about that time, uh, decided that what they really needed to do was put all of human knowledge together in a series of books. Ambitious, perhaps, but maybe not so different than Wikipedia uh, 250 years early, right? Uh, and Dahl there is one of the people in charge of it. He seemed to be really, really good at it. Uh, he likes to do mathematics. Uh, he wasn't great at it, but he was reasonably competent. Uh, he was a jerk. He fought a lot, he was terribly arrogant, and he was always desperate to be recognized. Less important to him than how good his math was, was that everyone believed that his math was very good. This was true in his sociology, this was true in his philosophy, this was true in his history writing. He really, really wanted people to know him, to like him, to love him. And we have their letters. We have all of their letters, we have almost all of their letters have been saved. So we can go back and we can see exactly what they were doing. Uh, the first two letters are short and vaguely administrative. The question about the natural law of negative one starts here. Let's read this and then let's think about the math. Alright. Dollar Beer has just sent Euler something. The previous letter sadly is one of them that's lost. We don't know exactly what Dollar Beer said. But Euler writes back and says, you must permit me to be in disagreement with your feelings on the natural law of the negative value of negative x, uh, which you believe not to be an imaginary number. I believe it is imaginary, and I believe it's equal to pi plus or minus 2n divided by the square root of negative 1, where pi indicates a circumference of a circle of diameter 1, and n is any whole number. Right, there's lots that's interesting here. First, uh, just the fact that the value of a logarithm problem involves plus and minuses and involves variables and involves weird things is going to bother Dahlberg there. A log should be easier than that. And he just viscerally dislikes this. Historically, there's something interesting here. You catch this thing that we just read? He had to define pi. <laughs> Did you use pi in anything you wrote up this summer? Did you talk to remind people exactly what it meant? And use that symbol? I mean, you've always defined our variables, right? If you're a physicist and you use t, you remind people it stands for time. You explain pi. Of course you don't explain pi! Uh, everyone in the world knows what pi is. It's not yet standardized. There's no agreement on what this is. Uh, early in his career, when Euler uses a symbol, he means 6.28 or so, referring to what we now call 2 pi. Uh, 
And I give this a chance to ask another question. It's a question I'd like you to get in the habit of asking if you're in a math class, if you're in a science class, and any uh, instructor writes a Greek letter on the board to stand for something. The first thing you should do is put your hand in the air and say, why that Greek letter? We got sister pi, right? Of all the symbols, they get this, so it's an important number. Take any circle in the world and measure around and measure across and divide. You always get the same value. Over the, the value comes up everywhere. It's an important number. It means a symbol. Why pi? <laughs> it turns out pi is the first letter and we can read read now what does it say perimeter the perimeter of a circle is like pi Nice. <laughs> it's not random. Uh, there's a reason for it. And Euler chooses it. People had used it occasionally before Euler. Uh, Euler was supposed to have realized it. Uh, and this is what's going on. And so they just start writing about this uh, the natural law of negative one. Dalembert writes back. Uh, Dalembert had at this time just submitted a paper <coughs> to one of Euler's journals, which included discussion of a lot of things, including logarithms of negative numbers. Uh, this point, what you just said it really disturbs me. I'd appreciate it if you'd cross out of my treatise, this thing I just submitted, cross out any portions where I discuss log negative numbers if it's not too late. See, Dolomir is not convinced, but he is savvy. He knows what is a better mathematician than him, and he decides not to put in press his belief yet. I'll just pretend I didn't say anything for now. He won't give up the argument, uh, but he doesn't want the world. To know what's going on. And the author does this, he moves on. Uh, and then Dahlenberg gives an argument involving hyperbolas and natural laws and tries to convince Euler sort of via picture uh, of, of his answer. Dahlenberg, by the way, I'm going to explain why in a minute, Dahlenberg believes that the natural law of negative one is the same as the natural law of one. That it's just zero. And Euler believes it's a very strange thing. Alright, uh, Euler doesn't respond right away, and Dahlenberg writes again another recurring theme. Correspondence, right? If the person doesn't respond, continue to badger them. Now he starts complaints. I've been thinking about what you said, and according to you, uh, this logarithm, the, the imagine that we need to find a function of y, which whenever you make y negative, doesn't change its value, but gives birth all of a sudden to an imaginary constant. And the eyes pop up. But I declare I'm unable to conceive of such a function. Uh, I, I can't imagine something like that. Does it count as math? He's not a great mathematician. Uh, but he tries to give his answer. And let's pause here and think about the answer. What do we know about the natural law of negative one? Do you know what you know it's equal to? There's an easy way always to remember what it's equal to, which is you start with your favorite equation and work backwards. Uh, in all of mathematics, what is your favorite equation? This question has it for you. One plus one equals two. No. That was pretty good, but there's a better one. Okay. <laughs> you yes! Yes, yeah, it has to be. It has to be your favorite. Uh, <laughs> we know that e to the i times pi is equal to negative. We sometimes write this as e to the i pi plus one equals zero because then you get to use five really awesome numbers in one equation. For our purposes, this will be more useful. Uh, I'll also make the historical point that the Euler gets credit for this. Now, we did all the math for this. Nowhere in any of Euler's papers or books does this equation appear. It appears with variables. It appears with signs and cosines. It's never written this way. Just a little weird and almost sad. Uh, I'm so happy to get the credit. How do we get the natural log of negative one? Well, I'm taking the natural log of both sides. Natural log of e to the i pi is i pi. So I pi is a natural log of negative one. Must be. Must be. What does Dahlenberg say? Dahlenberg gives a really interesting argument in this paper, uh, in which he says, let's use the laws of logarithms to figure this out. He says, I don't know what the natural log of negative one is, but certainly it's equal to the natural log of one over negative one. Right, one over negative one uh, is negative one. He also says we have laws of logarithms. And if we're going to have negative numbers, the laws of logarithms should work for them too. 
This is a good approach, right? When we do exponents, we use this. When we do exponents of irrational numbers or negative numbers, the way we define them is just by trying to make sure the laws always work the same way. So it must be the case that this is the natural log of one. Uh, let's see. Minus the natural log of negative one. Does that look right? Yes. All right, we can now add this to both sides. This says that two times the natural log of negative one is the natural log of one. We know what the natural log of one is. It's zero, and therefore the natural log of negative one must be zero. They're both obviously right. Really clear, can't be wrong. Pretty darn simple, can't be wrong. What's going on? It's a hard question. It's not a question I'm going to answer for you. Uh, by the way, this is your, your math riddle I leave you with. If this is flawed, what's the flaw? Do you have any ideas yet? Let me just give this away. This is a really full cool Anybody prove the rules for negative numbers? We do still accept it. If any complex analysis book, it'll tell you the rules are good for negative numbers. It took me quite a while the first time I read this. Uh, I was sort of puzzled for a while. Yeah, you might dislike this part, but then when you have a function, put an argument in it, so you should still write the argument in any form. It seems like it shouldn't change if there's any boring talks later today, you are the boss and nobody can comment on this problem. Uh, Euler is not convinced. Euler knows the problem with the Ampere solution, and you eventually will too. Uh, this is not that obvious. Anyway, it's kind of fun. The puzzle over. Uh, Dombier keeps writing about this. Or there are negative numbers, or there are lots of negative numbers. Euler is getting increasingly annoyed, really, because Dombier is not listening. Dombier is wrong. Euler has explained why he's wrong. Uh, and all Dombier wants is for Euler to ignore the math and just say, gee, Dombier, you're brilliant. I guess I'll agree with you. Uh, and so he keeps writing. Euler tries to back out of this. Uh, Euler writes and says, listen, I've heard from Mr. Harper Tweet, this guy that they both know, that you're going to stop working in math for a little while to reestablish your health. I approve so heartily of this resolution that I will not trouble you anymore by discussing bonds of negative numbers. I know you're six, please don't bother with this. Uh, also, I can't think of anything else to say. Uh, but Dalmere writes again and again about this. And finally, Euler writes back and says, negative numbers and error logarithms uh, are no longer so familiar to me that I can really respond at it. Uh, I, I just don't remember the details of the character, which of course is not true. <laughs> right? He's Euler. I mentioned Virgil's Aeneid earlier. You know, Euler read the Aeneid when he was a boy and memorized it. And toward the end of his life, uh, he would say, Professor Euler, do you remember the copy of the Aeneid you read when you were a boy? He'd say, yes, of course I did. He would say, do you remember page 173? He'd say, uh, yes, yes, here's how it started to recite to you, page 173 of the book. He forgot nothing. Uh, for the end of his life, there's another story about two of his assistants who did a calculation of the infinite series, and their calculations differed in the 50th decimal place. Euler, who was blind at the time, said, give me a minute, sat there for half an hour ago, uh, sat an hour or so, and said, uh, he's right. Uh, working it out in his head, he did whole pages and pages of calculations, and of course he remembered this, he's just refusing to talk. Uh, but down there now, he's mad. He's mad at Euler for not listening to him. He's mad at Euler for ignoring him. And he's so mad that he sends a letter to the Berlin Academy of Sciences complaining about Euler. He says, Euler is taking credit for four different things, uh, discoveries in math and science. Uh, the precession of the equinoxes. You know that 23 degree tilt of the Earth? It's tilted relative to the way that we orbit the sun. You know that changes over time? It swings up and down like this, and what it really does kind of goes around in a circle. Uh, it's even more complicated. You can look at the Axis that it goes around, and that thing also goes around. Uh, it's infinite little regress. So, uh, Euler wrote about this. Uh, Bellamere said, I, I did it first. This question of cuspidal points of the second kind, which is roughly whether there's any equation that can trace out a curve like this. Right? You say, That's not a function. You know, it's a curve. Uh, are there algebraic equations that give uh, things like this? Uh, there's an argument of the fundamental theorem of algebra, which Euler tried to prove. He thought he had succeeded. Uh, the question of natural log of negative one, Dallenbeer says really publicly, right, this is like an editorial, that Euler's stealing credit for all of this. Euler was even willing to give in on the first two of Dallenbeer. It wasn't enough 
and it got worse and worse until Euler, as far as we know, for the only time in his professional life, snapped. Uh, they started sniping each other in press and writing bad things about each other again and again. Here is uh, maybe not the most vicious, but an interesting one because of where it appears. That one there, remember, did the encyclopedia, the big encyclopedia. There's even a journal associated with it. We're going to publish all of human knowledge. And if knowledge is being created, then we really have to make sure we can put in new knowledge. And so this is uh, there's home turf. Uh, and Euler is asked to write something. If you look right down here, uh, that's my other new PowerPoint trick. This is, comes from years of watching Star Trek. <laughs> Computer, enhanced image. <laughs> All right, so uh, what does Euler say? He says, listen, all of the newspapers, uh, which have announced the third volume of D'Alembert's mathematical works, remark that I have refuted many points of his. First thing, notice everybody says, I pointed out he's wrong already, and this illustrious author, uh, sarcasm intended, uh, uh, himself mentions this. Uh, and how, uh, how profound he is, and I think uh, it goes on here. Uh, I've already become very accustomed to these criticisms, since Dalembert has attacked me many times, and on many points. Ah, uh, this doesn't sound like him. This doesn't sound like modern writers. Uh, look at somebody's paper, and you read papers this summer. How many of them started by complaining about other people? It's not done. It wasn't done then by many people. It was never done by either, except here. The friendship which ended over the natural law of negative one. Uh, Euler, in fact, went so far as to commit his only unprofessional and unethical act in his life. Uh, I told you he was often good about giving priority. There was one time when D'Alembert really did prove a result before Euler. Uh, 1759, Euler proved something. He then got a letter from D'Alembert showing that D'Alembert had done it a year earlier. This time, Euler refused to get in. The 1757 edition of his journal hadn't come out yet. So he took his new result and tucked it into that one, making it look like he had done it two years earlier and stealing credit. <sighs> and our hero is not perfect. <laughs> and this is why, uh, this is a problem. Here, one last summary. Then let's take logarithms of negative numbers. Who cares? All of my was near at the time certainly cared about this. this part of math that we really needed to figure out. The winner could only have been what? Five fights. What do we take away about the nature of mathematics? Uh, I think there are a lot more stories. Uh, it's worth looking for these because they're always fun. They always give us something. But we should remember this, and this might be obvious to you now, that's what you've been doing this summer. Mathematicians, like everybody else, are illogical are emotional, are governed by personal desires, uh, and things that aren't just math. I'm convinced that studying their fights really tells us a lot about uh, the way mathematics is done. And with this conclusion, I stop and think.
questions? So in your list of uh, Newton versus all the, year, the continental mathematicians, um, a few British mathematicians came to mind. Yes, like who? Taylor. Taylor? Uh, who we still remember today, actually, right? What's that? Who we still remember today. Sure. I mean, in fact, that may be one of the more important results of calculus, right? Right. Taylor's theories are huge. He was, he was British. You also might say McLaurin. That's uh, Taylor's little brother, right? Who wrote a, a well respected book, at least in England. Uh, the book is the Yeah, Taylor would be the, all right, I got it, the exception that proves the rule. Um, in fact, I'm sort of lucky that uh, in Dunham's book he didn't give a chapter to Taylor. Otherwise, the, the argument would be less good. And then it is, we, we should know this about history. You should know this about all of your classes. I remind this of my students that all of your instructors are lying to you all the time. <laughs> and it's not because they're jerks. It's because the truth is so, so complicated. If somebody asks you what you did this summer, you will not tell them the whole truth. Right? Because they know you're not going to know. Uh, so you'll lie a little bit. Uh, and it's a useful, friendly lie that actually communicates more knowledge in the end. Uh, and so really, it's like this too. Well, these stories are horrible summaries. All of them are more complicated. Uh, and it's worth remembering that, so we know in the back of our mind. And it's worth ignoring that as often as possible. Uh, it makes it possible actually to understand things and move forward. Is the Taylor theory the issue with the log of negative one something about two <laughs> Say that again? Is the issue with the log of negative one something about two pi yes. hanging on a circle? Yes. It's something about two pi. They're closing in on it. Do you know what it is? What's your reason? I haven't gotten there yet, but if you take the second to last line, you've got two log of negative one, and if e to the i pi, or if the log of negative 1 is i pi, then you get a 2 pi i equals 0. And if you're working on a circle, 2 pi really is 0. All right. Yeah, really close. Let's <laughs> <laughs> right. Any more questions? Let's thank Dominic again. And our next talk will be at 1030.